And so as we continue our worship service, as we open the Word of God, I ask you to bow your heads as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and we give you praise for the opportunity to come together, for the opportunity to worship, to lift up our voices in song, to lift up our hearts in praise to you, to hear your word and to act upon it. So bless each that hear, bless the one who speaks. May Jesus and Jesus alone be glorified and uplifted and heard here in this place. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever walk through and read the historical books of the Old Testament, and then you listen to it? Well, not me. Yep. You read them and say, you know what? I have a question with all the drama and everything that's going on. What was up with those Israelites? What in the world were they thinking? God led them through the Red Sea. After 400 years of bondage, after the plagues, they had a history. They told that history over and over again. Oral history, written down history, they're meticulous in recording their history. Even lineage, who, was, who begot who, who was in whose family, they detract all that, and they had nothing but history to show that God had been delivering them. Literally, they walked through an ocean on dry ground and then saw it close up after them. They were, what, a million, million and a half, two million people? The Bible doesn't say they ran through the Red Sea. It doesn't say they sped through it. They walked through the Red Sea on the same sandals that God preserved for 40 years that they didn't run out. They obviously didn't buy those at Payless. Somebody got that. <laughs> they were victorious over the city of Jericho by walking around it 13 times and then hitting it with sticks, blowing it up, C4. No, they shouted. And as the song says, the walls came tumbling down. They were led by godly, capable leaders through decades of their journey. Moses stuck with them through that 40 years, that extra that they didn't have to go through. But the spies came back with a, wrong, with a, a non-faithful story. And they even had as their king the wisest men, the wisest man, except for Jesus, who ever lived. King Solomon, known around the world as a wise, as a capable leader. And yet... Time after time, they were here, they were here. They were doing well, they were a hot mess. They got it right, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. Judges 2. And we ask ourselves, what was up with them? God delivered them through strong leaders, but as the Bible says, when the judge was dead, they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers to serve down and to bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings, from their stubborn way. Hard-headed, thick-headed. As I say back in, up in New England, they were numb. <laughs> and we read all this and we say, well, you know what? That happened today. Mm -mm, not us. That wouldn't be us at all. You've said it. You've read the story. You said, you know what? If God was walking with us, pillar of fire, and the cloud, and everything else. God, it's a kind of glory in the actual sanctuary. God with us. If we had all those reminders, there's no way that we would have done that, right? Oh, really? <laughs> Remind me again how this country started. The pilgrims came here, religious freedom, our strong and lengthy history of religious expression, however imperfect. We even have a freedom of religion written into our constitution. We have, in God we trust, written on our money. But yet, as a nation, do we actually trust God? If a casual observer, or even a recording angel, were to take a broad snapshot of our nation these days, what conclusions would they come to? Hmm? This is the past six days since Easter, Resurrection Sunday, if you will. What story has consumed most of the non-Ukraine news cycle? Any guesses? How about the defamation trial of a Hollywood actor, his ex-wife, and their extraordinarily toxic and dysfunctional marriage? Hmm. What did we just finish hearing about 24-7? Another, arguably, 
dysfunctional marriage. A grown man slapping another one on national, international TV. And that's all we heard about. Because that was the most important thing we should talk about, we should hear about. Everybody had a video on it, had a TV program on it, unpacking it, doing this, doing, all these other things. And now the same happens with this new family. How is it that we're so enamored with famous people in their broken homes? And that's what we need to focus on because maybe it's cathartic. If they're hot mess and I'm only half as bad, then I'm better, right? Mm. What consumes our attention, our time, our focus? Is it the word or not? Is it the latest TikTok video? The latest online challenge? I wonder if we've got to a point where if Jesus were to return today, hardly anybody would notice unless he had a funny video that went viral or unless he was scheduled to do a collab, a collaboration with Charlie De 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 D'Amelio or Kabi LeMay. Some of you are like, who? Some of you are like, oh, I know. The front row is like, yeah, I know who that is. That's why Sergio's got his head down. He's like, he did not just reference that in a sermon. Are you kidding me right now? Who are these two people? The rest of you are like, who? Them. 138 million, the young lady on the left, is the most popular TikTok influencer on the planet. 138 million followers. So second, a young man from Senegal who lives in Italy who does, if you've seen them, I've seen them, they're actually hilarious. Those videos where people are doing funny, odd things, like contorted type little projects or something. And then he does a very simple thing, and he's like, some of you are like, you spend too much time on the computer. Pray for me. <laughs> but can we say as a nation that we're really following and obeying God? Or do we follow the electronic and virtual idols that we have constructed? 138 million is more than a third of the population of this country. And far more than the population of most countries. And where does that let us? Real, for real. Are we in a better, more godly place? Or are we in a place where the company that brought us Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck now says it's wrong for teachers to not be able to talk to kindergartners about their own personal sexual preference and practices? So I ask again, would we really, honestly, not do the same types of things that the Israelites did, or maybe have we? We've had this for a couple thousand years over time. We've had evidence that God has been working. We have testimonies that God has been working in our own lives, and yet, as the nation, even as a community sometimes, who do we follow? Sunday through Friday. Perhaps... We see the decline even here, but we'll focus on Israelite, the Israelites right now because they were, in effect, a desperate people. If you read back through their story, they had had a high point there in Judges chapter 5, a high point that says at the very end, the land had rest for 40 years. Things were going well. And what did they do? Judges 1 verse 6, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so God delivered them into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. And this was pretty dramatic, pretty, pretty desperate time for them. They camped in dens and caves and had little farms in the mountains. And the Amalekites, the Midianites, people from the east would lay seeds. They would come to them, they're planting seeds, and they'd wait for growing season. And then they would come and occupy that territory, tear up the fields, take all the animals or kill them. And then they'd be poor and hungry. And they're an agrarian people. They grew things to live off of that. And yet there's nothing. Imagine if every time payday came around, somebody came and took all the food and all the necessities out of all the stores around here. No Walmart, no Food Lion, no Piggly Wiggly. Nothing. Like hurricane preps on steroids. And it happened every week. That's where they were at. And it lasted not just for seven days, seven months, seven weeks. It lasted for seven years. What would we do 
if we didn't, if we couldn't buy food for seven years, some of us go seven hours and things start to change a little bit. <laughs> so Israel was in desperate times. And then the Lord sent out a prophet because they cried out to the Lord because this was the cycle. We do well. We're quiet. Praise God. Yay. We start to fall away from God. Oh my goodness, this bad thing's happened. God save us. Hmm. And so a messenger came and told them, Thus says the Lord God, verse 8 and Genesis 6, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the land of those who oppressed you, and drove them all out. I said, I'm the Lord your God. Don't worry about the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. In other words, boiling it down, God said, hey, I got you. And yet, you have not obeyed my voice. And so the angel of the Lord comes and gives a message, an interesting message to Gideon. He says, as, we, as our sister Bessie read earlier, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, you mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, what? Who, me? Angel prophesying a bit on his behalf. And so he prepares, because hospitality is a common occurrence, is a gift, a cultural thing. He prepares a meal. The angel of the Lord touches it, fire consumes it, and Gideon knows that things just got real. <laughs> he says, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Verse 15. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. This is a theme, if you remember, over and over again. God doesn't pick the, the tallest all the time or the strongest all the time. He picks the weakest of the weak. Our own church. We're blessed with the gift of prophecy, not by one who is super strong or super educated, but one who is the weakest of the weak. And he gave Gideon a six-part path for victory. Because it's time to deliver God's people again. And so this time, he gives them a six-part plan. First step, he says, tear down all the idols. Tear all the altars down, all the places of worship. Tear it all down. Because you, before, you have to go, before you go into battle, you have to have a solid focus, a singular focus. You can't be distracted. You can't have divided loyalties. And they've had a history of seeing what happens with all that. And so Gideon goes with ten men by night, because he's afraid, because that mighty warrior thing hadn't fully manifested yet. And he tears down the idol to Baal. And the men of the city went nuts. They come to his father, they say, give us your son, how dare you do this? Imagine this, the Israelites, the leaders in that particular area are saying, because your son destroyed this idol's altar, we want to take him out. How far God's people had fallen. And the father replies, hey, if Baal is all that, let him defend himself. Sounds like Mount Carmel all over again. You can almost see prophet, hey, if, is he asleep? Wake him up. If Baal has got it going on, then Baal will do something. Meanwhile, there sits that stone, doing nothing. Should have been a hint, but... <laughs> and so, the altar was torn down. Step one complete. But question, what does your <coughs> idol altar, if you will, look like, if you have one? Where do we worship? Which places do we worship? What things do we worship when we leave here? Now... The vast majority, of course, our time and everything, we worship in God. We have that morning worship, have that family time together, praying and reading through the Bible all day. You've got it on the audio app that we talked about a few weeks back. All those things you're doing that you're saturating yourselves. Yes? No? Because then you go to work. You can't really play the Bible as you're working at whatever, right? Then you get into other things and talking about the latest bin show and talking about some months ago, was Game of Thrones, and now it's whatever fill-in-the-blank show. Maybe your altar is money or position. So for some people, it's gossip or grudges or pride. Did you see so-and-so? Oh my, mm, mm, I can't believe so-and-so did thus-and-so. 
You ever notice we sound so much like everybody else on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then we sound much different on Saturday? Or is that just me? <laughs> Maybe some have that secret altar. You know, the one that's hidden in here behind your lock screen. If you don't have the right fingerprint or the right pin code or the right password, nobody knows about it, right? You can delete your history. You can block that up, right? That secret altar. Maybe it costs you a lot of money. Maybe you're like, oh, if I just get another jack. Okay, oh, I got a three of a kind. Maybe something even more insidious. Maybe you're swiping left, swiping right, and your spouse is right there next to you asleep in bed. Hmm. Those altars. But back to Gideon. <laughs> Judges chapter 6. The Midianites and Malachites prep for battle. It's time to fight again because it's about that season. And they camp in the Valley of Jezreel, it's called. And so we come to step two of the plan. Gideon's been told he's going to be the deliverer. He's been told he's a mighty warrior. He's not really feeling it yet, but he's taking some steps. He's on the path. And now number two, familiar, be sure of God's call. He gathers everyone and blows a trumpet, but there's just this little problem. Gideon's not sure. He's like, well, I heard what you said, but I need some confirmation on that one. A very familiar passage. Some of you have even lived out this passage. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said, verse 6, he says this to God, by the way. God, if you meant what you said, if you actually weren't just telling me a story, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece and it's dry on the ground, then I shall know, I'll know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said. Putting out that fleece. So if it's wet, the ground is dry, then I know that you really actually, I was just deluded in thinking, making that up. And what happened? You know the story. Wet fleece, dry ground, good to go, right? No? No? <laughs> so round two. Okay, so dry fleece, wet ground, then I know for sure. Okay. And that's what God was thinking at this point. My boy, I told you. <laughs> I let you know. I came. You saw the sacrifice. I, I spoke to you directly. Let's get about this. Let's start. But Gideon needed some more assurance. Have you ever laid out a fleece? You've prayed about it. You've thought it through. You've done your pros and cons, your checklist, everything else. But you still, okay, just want to be sure. Here's that fleece. Because we want to be sure of God's call in one direction or another. That job, that individual, that relationship, that big move or, or not. But there are some things that don't require fleece, right? If you get an extra $10 in change back from the cashier, do you really need a fleece to tell you if you should give it back? Well, God, if, uh, maybe this is an unexpected blessing. Maybe you wanted me to have this extra $10. I'll tithe. I'll give a dollar. Or maybe just give that cashier the money back because it's not yours, right? Do we need to lay out a fleece to find out if God wants us to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop eating in unhealthy ways or making bad choices? Do we really need a fleece on that one? Maybe. Maybe not. But Gideon should have known that God was with him before he said, The Lord is with you, verse 12. Go and you shall save Israel. Have I not sent you? In verse 16, surely I will be with you. I'm with you. I'm sending you. I'm going to be with you. Sounds very familiar. Didn't Jesus say the same thing? All authority has been given unto me. Go therefore, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And yet, sometimes we still pull out our fleeces, even in the Lord's work, right? Hmm. But he said, Jesus did himself to us, John 14, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. I stand at the door and knock. I will come into him and dine with him, Revelation 3. Revelation 21, he is our God, he will be with us. He even sealed it with his own life. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And so step two, we wanted to be sure of God's call. Step three, you need to realize that God uses anyone and everyone he can use. Chapter 7, Gideon puts together the army. And he's got as many folks as are going to come out. It's time to fight. It's time to 
to liberate them from that. They had 135,000 folks. Quite a little army. Uh, wrong number, excuse me, 32,000. Wrong number. 32,000, still a good number, right? You can do a lot with 32,000. That's approaching, I don't know the exact number, that's comparable to how many folks work and live and train on the base. And so, time for, the, time for them to, to get together. But verse 2, the Lord says to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many to give the Midianites into their hands. I'm sorry, looking at the number, that, it is 135,000. And we've only got 32. That's like 4 to 1. And you're saying we, don't have, we have too many right now? So let's do some math. <laughs> that was about four times the size of the army, right? So if all those are good fighters, they're well-trained, everything else, they still have to take out four people for every single one of them. How many of you have been in the military before? Or are still in, currently? One, they got, oh my God, what's that? This and that. Any, any military minds thinking that's a good plan to cut down your, your true? You want to get more, Right? Marines don't need that, like 40 people and like an MRE and they're good. <laughs> yes. But four to one odds, that's still not good. And God says, way too many. And so he's going to have a test. Whoever is fearful and afraid, go home. Verse 3. Proclaim this in the hearing of the people. Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. In other words... You can't commit to this. Bye. I'm thinking one or two people left, a couple. How about 22,000? Now, Gideon, who was nervous at first, he just lost 69% of his forces. He's only got 10,000 left. There's something called the Law of Warfare, Deuteronomy 20. Basically, if you have a house or a vineyard, or you're engaged to be married, you have responsibilities, then you're kind of excused from service. And so, nearly 70% of the army leaves. And Gideon's like, okay, this is not good. This is 10,000. Now each of us have to be victorious over almost 14 people. Hmm. But the question is, why was 32,000 too many? But God says, lest... Israel claimed glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Okay. So we're good right now. 10,000, we're good. It's a lot, not as many. We'll make it happen. It's a strategy. Get them in a narrow place. We can kind of attack from above. Well, okay, we can do something with this. But God, knowing us so well and knowing his people so well, he knows there's something about human nature that the more resources we have, the more self-sufficient we become. And so another test. It's hot out. They're going to go to the river and get some water. He says, okay, let everybody drink. And Gideon stands back. You know the story. And some of them, they're kneeling down, and they're all the way down, and they're just drinking, drinking, drinking. Face all the way down. And some, doing this. Hmm. Interesting, two choices. But what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal that out of 10,000, only 300 were left, the ones who knelt down and kept looking as they took some water? The big deal is that all 10,000 thought they were heading into battle. They were in enemy territory. The, other, the troops could have attacked them at any time, but they put their own wants ahead of their duty. If you're looking down and, and slapping at water like this, you can't see what's going on. No, no perception at all. No situational awareness, as they say. So anybody can come and attack you. Yeah. So they put their own wants ahead of their duty. Their mind, their heart wasn't really in it the way it needed to be. And so now it's down to 300 people. You might say, well, that's an odd way to kind of pare down the numbers. But think of Matthew 14, the feeding of the 5,000. 
Jesus is there. He's got the 12 apostles. The little boy brought his lunch, loaves and fishes. You know the story. Quick question. When did the disciples eat? When did Jesus eat? It was after all the people ate. After they, they picked up, not coincidentally, 12 baskets of scraps. How many apostles were there? 12? We don't really get a picture or see any time where Jesus is grabbing some fish and bread, sitting down. No, no, go on, finish, finish. And he's eating while they served. The disciples put others' needs and duty ahead of their own comfort, ahead of their own needs. So now in Gideon's army, we're down to 0.9% of the original number. Super low. Not 1%, not 10%, less than 1% of the folks who are left over. In other words, if we're doing the math, it's one Israelite to 450 Amalekites. Anybody want to take those odds? Any, any Marines want to take those odds? Emery, no? <laughs> you might do okay with one to four. One to ten if you've got some mechanized assistance. But one to 100, 450, it's going to be quick. It's going to be painful. It's going to be a wipeout. How can 300 go against 135,000? Well, I read a, slang, a saying somewhere that, well, one with God is a majority. Second Kings, Second Kings 19.35, one angel took out 185,000 people. Hmm, maybe the 300 have a chance. Could God, couldn't God have used all 32,000, though? He did it other times, large armies, large battles. Joshua 4, he used 40,000. 1 Samuel 15, he used 210,000. Judges 20, he used 400,000. God can use big armies. He can use big groups. But the key point is this. God will fulfill his will through those who are willing to be filled. The 97% wasn't, wasn't worthy, or weren't uh, willing, I should say. God can do amazing things through a few who are devoted to him. Mm, so quiet right now. <laughs> Let me say it one more time. Maybe that was in, in, in Spanish. <laughs> God can do big things through small groups of people, through individuals, if they're willing to be filled. And so we've been through the first three steps. Tear down the idols, be sure of the call, reminding ourselves that God can use anyone and everyone he can use. But also, there are times where it's going to be hard, and God's there to encourage Judges 7, 9 through 11, it says this. The people took provisions, trumpets in their hands. Verse 8, he sent everyone away except for the 300 and the camp of Midians down there in the valley. It's almost time to battle. And the Lord says, arise and go, down into, go against the camp, for I've delivered it into your hand. But if you're afraid to go, go there with your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened. And so he and his servant, Purah, go down and they, they sneak down and see what's going on in the camp. And they hear these two people talking. A man telling a dream to his companion. I've had a dream. And he goes on, I'll lies the dream. And his companion says, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, a man of Israel. And God has delivered Midian and the whole camp into his hand. This is the enemy saying this. And Gideon just happens to you know the odds of coming upon the one or two out of 135,000 who had this dream and this discussion? And he just happens to come down and happens to hear this, that even the, the Amalekites are saying, the, the, um, the Midianites are saying, we're going to lose. Hmm. It's a word of encouragement. Because God always has the right time and the right words to encourage us when times get rough. Think of Elijah. He had that big Mount Carmel showdown. God was victorious, and yet he flees from Jezebel. He's in the cave having a pity party. Birds bringing him food, and he's drinking this water. And he's saying, oh, it's only me. 
And God says, no, no, I have thousands more people. You're not the only one. John the Baptist in prison. Encouragement. Jesus' own baptism. This is my son in whom I well pleased. The modern transfiguration. Moses and Elijah encouraging Jesus as he's entering into this time of trial. There will be challenging times. You've had challenging times. And yet a word in due season can make it all better. A word of hope can turn the tide. If you have hope, you can press on. If you've lost hope, it doesn't work at all. So the question for us is, are we, in the midst of all this anxiety, all this stress, all this life that's happening, are we on a daily basis in encouraging people, in affirming people? Do we share a word of hope with somebody who's struggling? Next step, make a plan. Now we know, we've heard, that a plan only survives until first contact. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But here's the plan that, that uh, Joshua, or excuse me, Gideon came up with. They got inspired. It says divide them into three groups. So not 300 in one big mass, but three groups of 100. And they're going to bring what? A trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. Again, we're back to the strategy thing. No swords, no spears, no slingshots, no weapons of any kind. Trumpet, pitcher, torch. Now, if I'm reading the story and not knowing how the end goes, I'm thinking Gideon might not be quite that mighty warrior that, uh, that we'd heard about. Nobody's got a sword? Really? But what was their battle cry? The sword of the Lord and of the Spirit, or excuse me, of Gideon. Hmm. Okay. So they're going into battle. This is their plan. Reminds you of um, going around Jericho 13 times. Doesn't seem like it'll work, but then let's see what happens. Because we need to remember and realize who actually gives the victory. That was Gideon's masterful strategy the reason why they won? No. There are massive numbers, all hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who attacked the Amalekites and the, and the Midianites and just drove them away. Was that it? Mm -mm. It was their faith. It was their commitment. It was their trust. And God came through. Judges 7.22, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion. The Midianites and Malachites fought themselves, took themselves out. When the pitchers were smashed, and they saw the torches, the trumpets were blown. They took themselves out. And 300 people beat 135,000. I'm sorry, 300 people and one, which made all the difference. So the question is, Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for sharing the story. It's 1230. What's this all mean? I'm hungry. I'm trying to get that lunch going. Blood sugar's a little bit low. How does this apply to us thousands of years later? So glad you asked. What do you think God wants to do here in Jacksonville and Oslo County? 2022-2023? Give you a hint. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he tells his followers, go therefore and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Sounds like a plan. But you say, well, um, by the way, there's only a few of us here. I'm just eyeballing this. If, if we have 80 people in here, I'd be surprised. We're probably more like 50, 60-ish, if that, at the moment. Plus the Spanish church, is that on 15 more folks? We're less than 100, right? How many folks in Oslo County, roughly? 100 plus thousand? And if you expand it out, thousands and thousands of people. We're about, let's, let's go friendly, uh, friends and family, inviting other folks. We're 100 people, let's say. How in the world are we going to reach thousands of people with the small number that we have here. Well, 
With two people, God started the human race. With eight people, he brought that race back from the abyss. Just eight people in the ark. With 12 people, God turned the world upside down. And in January 1862 in Washington, New Hampshire, 14 people started a movement. I should say, God started a movement through 14 people. In that cold church. Had the, the opportunity when we were pastoring in, in New England to preach at that church. This is way more comfortable. Trust me, they don't even have a furnace in that church. So it's wintertime because Maine winters are actually cold, believe it or not. <laughs> With snow, especially in New Hampshire. And so that little church, 14 people, started a worldwide movement that God directed and guided. 21.9 million members worldwide. 212 out of 235 countries that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in. Messages and preaching and, and ministry in 535 different languages. Over 9,400 schools that serve more than 2 million students around the world. We have 229 hospitals and sanitariums, more than 1,600 clinics, with more than a million inpatient and 21 million outpatient visits every single year. And ADRA, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, is in more than 130 countries, more than 1,500 projects, more than almost 21 million people worldwide that have benefited. They're in Ukraine right now helping folks. And all this from a little church in Washington, New Hampshire, with no furnace, wooden pews, literally 90 degrees, solid wood, still the same ones. 22 million members in the movement, Seventh day Adventist Church, started from 14. Hmm. So, what could he do with us here in Jacksonville? What could happen here if God's people in these, within these walls, and God has people outside, don't, don't misunderstand. But what could God do with us and through us here in Jacksonville? I'd say he's got a six-step plan. We've kind of outlined it. Tear down the idols. Be sure of his call. Remember, he can use any and all of us as we encourage each other and as we have a plan. Not just, well, let's go talk to people. Let's preach. Let's share the gospel. Make a sign. But also give God the glory. Because none of this is going to happen without him blessing it and encouraging it and uplifting it and creating those divine appointments that make it all happen. Amen. Because God fulfills his will through those who are willing to be filled. Amen. So next week we will talk about, we'll start to talk a bit about God's plan for us here. We've talked about it as elders and recommended it. We voted on it as a church board. And it's a plan that's going to help us establish a culture. I'll find the slide later. A plan that will help establish a church-wide, or reestablish a church-wide culture of evangelism. Where all of our departments and our ministries work together to reach out and to impact our community for God. And we're going to assess what's growing and what's going well and, and continue to, to boost that. And we'll address which areas may need some special focus and bring those into a stronger place as well. We're going to take an entire month just, just to devote it to revival and to reconnecting and to reaching out to former members who have not been coming for whatever reason. And hold various outreach events to connect with friends and neighbors and a series of reaping meetings early next spring. Where we're not just going to invite and study and baptize but help encourage and build discipleship and spiritual mentorship here in the family of God. It's not enough that folks will come in the door if they only hang around for a little while and then go out the side door. And it's not about amazing potlucks like we had last week. But maybe inviting something, someone to your house on a Tuesday. Or maybe getting together as friends on some random Wednesday. Or having a game night or family fun on a Saturday night. But more about that next week.
Until then, and as we move forward as a church family, that would solicit your prayers, your commitment, as we see what God will do. Because, as we know, and as we will see, God does fulfill his will through those who are willing to be filled. Happy Sabbath. Thank you.